Amanda was thrilled with what seemed to be her perfect life. She had a lovely home in a great area, and her husband loved her. They had been trying to get pregnant for three years before Amanda got the great news that she was pregnant. Things seemed to be going the way they had hoped, even though fixing up their house was hard work. However, Amanda's husband told her out of the blue that he was leaving, which was not what she expected. He quickly stopped being in her life, leaving her alone, pregnant, and with a lot of bills. Without warning, Amanda was left mentally and financially broken, and she had to take care of her unborn child all by herself. Amanda was lucky to have her friend Anna by her side. Anna suggested that Amanda ask for help at Keys 1065, the neighborhood radio station. When the radio show heard Amanda's story, they chose to help. They knew it would be hard to help her by themselves, so they asked local companies to help make things easier for Amanda. Amanda didn't know that she and Anna were called to the radio studio to be guests on a special Give Back show. When the hostess got there, she announced the surprise section and thanked Anna for making it possible. She also told the audience about Amanda's tough situation. Amanda was able to tell her story on the radio after talking about the problems she was having getting pregnant. During her chat with the hosts, she talked about how shocked and uncertain she was about the sudden change in events that messed up their plans. Even though they spent two years and all of their funds fixing up their house, Amanda had to face the fact that their planned year of prosperity had fallen apart, especially since they were going to have a baby soon. Amanda said she wanted to keep the house and raise her child there, but she wasn't sure how she could do that. The hostess was moved by Amanda's emotional story and told her that they wanted her to focus on having the baby without thinking about money. She was shocked and the waitress pointed to a TV screen and showed her house. The hosts then gave her a virtual tour and a vacuum cleaner, which was funded by Scrub Online Cleaning Service and meant six months of cleaning services to ease her mind. Amanda walked into the kitchen and saw that the fridge was full of meals from Eat Fit Foods. For the next three months, meals will be delivered every day. After getting her groceries, Amanda continued her tour and was shocked to see a table full of baby gear worth $4,000 from Baby Village. This included a stroller, car seat, changing table, and baby monitor. On top of that, there was a $1,000 voucher for baby photos. Amanda sat there with a huge smile on her face and tears running down her face. Amanda felt like a huge weight had been lifted off her shoulders when she realized that the shocks were over. But the host said to look for anything else, and the camera focused on the oven's handle with a tea towel hanging over it. The host made a joke about the tea towel, and everyone in the room was shocked and the oven door was opened. A good amount of cash was neatly bound together in the oven. Amanda was so amazed that she almost fell off her chair. The Middlesex Academy Learning Center kindly gave her $10,000 to help pay her mortgage, which took away another worry from her life. Amanda cried tears of joy when she knew she and her baby would have a place to live for the next few months. She had been stressed out for five weeks about being a young mother by herself with no one to help her. It was a big surprise to her that her life would change so much that morning. Amanda felt lucky to be a part of this unexpected turn of events as she sat next to her excited friend Anna, who was a big part of making the event happen. Amanda felt excited about the future all of a sudden thanks to the radio station and other businesses in the area. Amanda was so moved by the kindness that she was crying as she told the person, I can't tell you how much this means to me. This means I don't have to move, she cries. With the kindness and help of strangers, Amanda's year wasn't what she had hoped for, but she now had a bright future ahead of her. She could finally unpack, put her furniture in order, and make plans for how she would live with her new baby. Little things can mean a lot to someone who is in need, even if you don't think they're important. It's a lesson to be thankful for what we have and to see the power of being kind, generous, and paying it forward. No one plans to be in a vulnerable position, but when they are, coming together as a community and helping each other can make a big difference. That's all about the first story and now let's watch another similar story. In the kitchen of a normal apartment, a table was set with everyday foods like duck, olives, apple slices, and a cake. 
Wendy, the party girl who looked good even though she was 70 years old, sat in the middle, where she always did. Wendy looked nice because she had been a doctor for more than 40 years. Sam, her husband, sat in a wheelchair next to her. There were no other people there, so it was very quiet. The old cuckoo clock's hourly chimes broke up the silence. Wendy was sad on her birthday and had hoped that a friend would come over, but even her friend was sick. Wendy poured wine for herself and Sam and talked about how sad she was about getting older and not having any well-wishers around. She admitted that getting older was hard and talked about how hard it was to stay healthy. Wendy thought about how her life had changed since her friend James passed away and how no one seemed to care about them anymore. Sam had just had a stroke and was still having trouble speaking and eating, so she started to feed him. Wendy sat down with a picture album after taking care of Sam and putting him to bed. As she turned the pages, she thought about the memories that went with each picture. The book had pictures from Sam and Wendy's wedding that showed how young and happy they were. Wendy also talked about her best friend Jenna and the fun times they had as college students when they went to a birthday party together. No matter how many years had passed, Wendy shed a tear as she turned each page and learned more about her life as a doctor. Sam was the head of the history department at the university. They met when they were students and had no idea what challenges they would face on their long and eventful trip through life. They celebrated together in the dorm kitchen, where they ate a simple meal of fried potatoes with onions and chopped sausage and fish on newspaper. They drank port wine and the unique Soviet lemonade that is now impossible to find. Sam, who is known for being funny, was the life of the party by playing his guitar and telling funny stories. By chance, Wendy, who is shy and quiet, became interested in and impressed by Sam, who is outgoing and full of life. She sang along with his songs and felt like she had a lot in common with the famous French actor Mario Matthew. Throughout the night, Sam politely pursued Wendy and even offered to walk her home. Over time, their dates turned into a simple marriage, and they spent the rest of their lives together, through all of life's ups and downs. They were both happy with their jobs because they were lucky enough to be doing what they loved. Over time, the couple got their own room and enjoyed fixing things around the house themselves. During the summer, they liked to spend time relaxing on the beach by the water. But the couple had a big disappointment, they had a hard time getting pregnant. Even though they went to the doctor and even a fortune teller out of desperation, nothing helped. Still, they thought about adopting a child from an orphanage, and Wendy became well known and liked in her job as a babysitter, pouring her unfulfilled maternal love into taking care of other people's babies. Sam never criticized Wendy for not being able to have a child, even though she was clearly upset about it. Sam had a philosophical view on accepting things that were out of their control. Due to her inconsistent periods, Wendy thought she was going through early menopause. But then, a miracle happened, she felt the movement of a baby inside her. Samantha's sudden pregnancy made Sam very happy. He was thrilled about the idea of becoming a dad. He told Wendy she couldn't do any housework because he knew her age made the pregnancy more dangerous. Wendy, on the other hand, had terrible morning sickness, swelling, and many other problems during her pregnancy. At least things turned out well in the end, and the woman gave birth to a healthy boy, though a little early. They gave their son the name James and were very attached to him. They couldn't stand to be away from him and got him all the nicest clothes they could find. They rushed to comfort him every time he cried. James had a great childhood because he had many toys, imported gadgets, a phone, a Walkman, and a computer before his friends did. During his early years, James turned into a wonderful, kind, and good child. He was excited to help his dad build ships and airplanes, learn how to solder and work with wood, and fix bikes in the shed. He loved and honored his parents and did what they told him to do. Teenage years, on the other hand, brought about a big change. James became hard to get close to because he became rude and irritable. His parents were upset because he behaved in uncertain and sometimes dangerous ways. Even though his parents tried to teach him good things, it seemed like their efforts were for nothing. When Wendy sensed that something was wrong, 
she often told Sam about it and suggested that they get professional help, maybe from a counselor at the hospital where she worked. Fearing James would get into fights with other boys, skip class, or even just smell like cigarettes, she kept an eye on him. But Sam didn't listen to Wendy's worries because he thought they were too dramatic. He thought James was just going through a tough time and told his wife that it would be over soon. Sam did everything he could to get James a state-funded spot at a well-known university, preferably in the economics department. James seemed unhappy about this apparent chance, sharing that he wanted to become a traveler or a truck driver instead of going into economics. His parents were shocked and worried about their son's future after hearing this news. James only made it through three classes before he was kicked out for missing too many classes. Sam was determined to make things right, so he went to the dean's office in person and found out that James had barely been to any classes this semester. The usual reason was given, James had fallen strongly in love with a person who was immoral and not serious about love, which caused him to neglect his studies and get into a lot of trouble. At home, a big scandal broke out when Sam addressed his son and told him he was upset that James was ruining his life. Sam begged James to change his mind, do better in school, and come back the next year. But James replied defiantly, saying he didn't like the economics department and that it was boring to hear about economic trends. He said that not everyone could be as smart as his parents and that Emily thought a real man should know how to make money to support his choice. Wendy was angry that Emily was having an effect on James, so she tried to talk to him about Emily's difficult past. There were always fights in the family, which is why James finally left home. He rented a rundown apartment in the suburbs and moved in with Emily, even though no one wanted him to. James was determined to show everyone, especially his parents, that he had made the right choice by choosing Emily. He was a very emotional and explosive person. Even though they had problems all the time, he was deeply in love with Emily, almost to the point of obsession. Emily was very good at controlling people, so she easily had James in her grip. He knew what she was doing, but whenever she showed affection, his feelings seemed to get in the way of his better sense. The fact that James got a part-time job to help pay his bills showed how far he was ready to go for Emily, who had a big impact on him. Students were paid different amounts for different tasks, but James felt he had to help his lady buy fun, expensive clothes. She insisted on living in luxury even though she had grown up poor. She kept telling James to enjoy the present moment, pointing out how short youth is and warning him against a life full of plans and constant saving. She told him to get a better job so that they could have more money and enjoy life while they still could. James did temporary work in the far north because his girlfriend insisted, so he could make more money for her expensive tastes. Even though he worked hard, bad things happened, and James passed away when he fell from a high place to work. Wendy was so sad when she heard this terrible news because she thought her son was the most important thing in her life. Wendy loved her son very much, even though he did bad things in the past and was sometimes unpleasant. Sam was motivated to get justice, so he sued the company and found that safety rules were not being followed. But the money he got was very small and didn't help him deal with the loss of his son. The boyfriend who had been bad for James showed up to his wake dressed sexily and drunk, which was very brave. Sam couldn't hold back his rage and attacked her, saying she was to blame for James's bad decisions and the end of his life. Sam was hurt by this argument, and he soon after had a stroke. Wendy was already dealing with the loss of her son, and now she had to take care of her sick husband as well. The problem seemed impossible to solve, which made me feel hopeless. Jenna, Wendy's friend, helped her feel better and stood by her during this hard time. Jenna gave Wendy both money and love, which helped her get through the hard times. Since her family had been through so much tragedy and was still having problems, Wendy thought that her family was cursed. Grief, illness, and money problems seemed to keep coming back. Still, Wendy was able to get through the hard times with the help of her friend Jenna. There were times of comfort, like when Jenna would visit and share a bottle of homemade wine as a small break from all the hard things that life had thrown at them. They would drink their drinks in quiet, and then Jenna would tell Wendy to cry, scream, or sing to show how she felt. 
Jenna knew when Wendy was having a bad day, and Wendy would cry on her friend's back to feel better. She felt a little better after that because it made her feel a little better. Now that Wendy was retired, she spent all of her time working. She found power and meaning in helping sick kids get better. What she did gave her inner drive and gave her life. Wendy wasn't patient with being bored, even when she was retired. It made her happy to be able to help sick kids get better, and her job left her feeling fulfilled. She was able to save money over time and use it to make her husband's life better. She bought a modern stroller that was easy to move around and put in a ramp at the front door of their house, which she paid for herself because she knew that walks were her crippled husband's only way to relax and change things up. Sam loved it when Wendy took him to the park on the weekends so he could watch ducks and swans at a small pond. It took his mind off of his troubling thoughts and gave him a break and variety in his life. Wendy loved Sam very much, even though he was sick. They were so perfect for each other that she couldn't imagine life without him. Wendy closed the family book with a heavy sigh as she turned the last page. The alarm went off ten times, but she didn't want to sleep. Instead, she chose to listen to the phone's answering machine and delete notes that weren't needed. Among the normal messages from the post office and social workers, there was an odd one, the voice of a thin child saying she was her granddaughter Betty. The child said she was in a shelter near the city library and was having a hard time. She begged Wendy to take her away. Wendy passed out and played the tape over and over again until she realized it wasn't a joke but a real plea. She was shocked and confused and asked how they could have a granddaughter when their son had been passing for 10 years and no one knew of his wife or children. It sounded like the child was really worried and sad, not just having fun. Wendy woke up her husband, and the message that she hadn't seen coming hung heavy in the air. Wendy didn't want to wake up her husband, so she called her friend Jenna instead because she was too tired. Wendy quickly told them about the confusing message she had heard on the answering machine and said she was sorry for the late call. She was shocked and said she wasn't sure if it was a joke. She also said it was possible the child had called the wrong number. Wendy was told by Jenna to check out the shelter to see if there was a girl named Betty. Wendy could try to talk to her if that's the case. If that doesn't work, she could delete the recording and move on with her life. Jenna thought Wendy would not stop until she found out the truth because she knew Wendy well. Wendy gave Sam the tape in the morning, and while he was thinking, he began to count and figure things out. Wendy didn't know how old the child was when he asked. With great excitement, Sam thought that the child might be their granddaughter because James had spent time with Emily. Wendy laughed it off, saying that the girl could have been seeing a lot of different people and that the baby, if it was real, could belong to anyone, not just James. Wendy wasn't sure, but Sam insisted on going to see for himself because he was worried about the little girl's scared and worried voice. Wendy agreed, and Sam told her that while he was gone, a friend would watch over her. Wendy got ready to go to the shelter. It was easy for her to find the dark building with the dull playground that hadn't been fixed. She felt bad about what she saw and thought about how she could make the kids' lives better by cleaning up the grounds and adding bright decorations to make it feel less scary, like a hospital. Wendy talked to the boss, a tough woman, for an hour when she got there, trying to get her to let her see Betty. The boss was firm at first, saying that Betty had nothing to do with Wendy. Things looked like they were getting more complicated, which made Wendy eager to find out the truth about her mystery granddaughter. Her mother passed away, and because her husband was drunk and violent, she had to be put in an orphanage. People were warned not to get their hopes up because the details she gave sounded more like something a child would make up, especially since she didn't have any official family ties. Wendy insisted that she would handle the problem on her own and said she would just talk to the girl before leaving right away. Even though Wendy didn't want to at first, the older woman finally gave in to Wendy's emotional plea and quietly gave the manager some money. She set aside the money just for her trip home. When Wendy suddenly changed how she felt, she told the manager to bring Betty to the playroom. Wendy was shocked when she saw the girl, but then she understood. It was impossible not to notice how much the child looked like her late son. 
The child had his crooked nose, eyes, and slightly curly yellow hair. The shape of the figure was the same too, tall and sharp. Wendy started the talk by saying hello and saying she was interested in hearing Betty's story. She asked Betty's parents about her parents and why she thought Wendy was her grandma. She also wanted to know how old she was and how she got Wendy's phone number. In answer, Betty started to tell her story in a way that was surprisingly mature. She used to be happy and spent time with her mother Emily, who worked as a cleaner. But things went badly for them when Anthony, her dad, came into the picture. Anthony was a bad person who liked to drink too much and act out, so he often kicked them out of the house. Betty knew her mother loved her and treasured the memories of bedtime stories, even though other people thought differently. Sadly, Betty's mother passed away six months ago from a severe sickness that could not be treated. She is still grieving over the loss. She gave me a piece of paper with her phone number on it and whispered, Honey, if you ever get really sick, call this number. It's your grandmother, she'll help. After my mother passed away, I moved in with my stepdad and had to deal with his cruelty, beatings, and being kicked out of the house. I was so hungry that I had to beg for food near the metro. Because worried neighbors told child safety about me, I was put in this orphanage. But I can't stand living here, the nannies are mean, and the girls make me do bad things for them while they serve them. I thought things couldn't get any worse, so I called you when the office boss wasn't there. Could you help me? I know my mom wouldn't lie to me, right? Betty locked eyes with Wendy, which made Wendy feel very strongly. Wendy hugged the upset girl and promised to do her best. Wendy chose to bring Betty home to her and Sam, even though the boss had suggested that they adopt her. Betty told the possible adopted family that she didn't feel comfortable with them by saying that the woman's cold, empty eyes reminded her of a fairy tale Snow Queen. Betty said she wanted to live with Wendy because she had kind and gentle eyes. Wendy told Betty that she would come back. When Wendy got home, she told Sam about the emotional meeting because she was sure that Betty was their granddaughter. She pointed out the details that matched, Emily, Betty's mother, was born the same year as their late son James, and she looks a lot like him. Wendy told Sam to get the paperwork together for an adoption application right away, before the foster family showed interest. Sam understood how bad Betty's past was and shook his head to show sympathy. He knew how hard it was for her to live with her difficult mother and stepfather. Wendy was thinking about what to do next, so she asked her friend Jenna for advice. She knew that getting a second opinion would help her. She thought about the problems and choices that lay ahead. One head is good, but two is better, she said. Jenna listened carefully and then answered quickly. She suggested that they go together and bring a recorder to record their chat. She told them to turn it on before they spoke, just in case. Wendy was shocked and wondered why she needed a tape recorder at home and why she was taking such extra steps. Jenna, who was getting a little angry, said that Molly might be up to something, like wanting money, and stressed that working with orphans like Betty could be very businesslike. Jenna told Wendy that she would get help with how to use the recorder because her son was a writer and had access to such tools. She acknowledged that their age doesn't know much about modern technology and emphasized how important it is to be careful in this situation. Wendy agreed, and the next morning, the two women went to the shelter with the necessary papers. When Wendy said she wanted to be Betty's guardian, the shelter manager laughed at her because she was old and her husband was sick. He turned down the idea, saying that Betty was already going to be adopted by another family and that the process for getting control was already underway. Wendy wouldn't give up. She insisted on proving her relationship to Betty, bringing up the child's choice and asking if it was okay to ignore the child's opinion. Molly, Wendy's boss, kept making fun of her and enjoying how powerful she thought Wendy was. Molly proudly told everyone that the other family had offered a lot of money, making it clear that she would side with them. Molly told Wendy that she should save money if she wanted to fight for her granddaughter, even though Betty was related to her and she thought the girl would get used to her new home. Wendy refused to give up and said she was going to fight for Betty. She said she thought the idea of selling children was immoral. 
The headmistress spoke back with a grin, ending the argument without a clear answer. As the women rushed out of the shelter, Molly said, You're such a moralist, aren't you? Who cares about those poor orphans? No one cares about them at all. Let them be happy that I'm putting them up somewhere. I won't keep you any longer, I have a lot to do. Wendy was so angry that she commented on Molly's lack of shame in publicly taking money from people and even forcing them to pay her. Wendy thought maybe they could do something about it. Wendy felt better when Jenna comforted her by patting her on the pocket where the tape recorder was and telling her that they had recorded everything as proof. Wendy thought of someone she knew, Andrew, a successful lawyer, who had been treated by a pediatrician for asthma when he was a kid. Jenna said that they should ask Andrew for advice on what to do and where to go. Wendy said yes, so they asked Andrew to meet up, and he agreed. Andrew agreed to help Wendy during the meeting because he was thankful for the pediatrician's help in the past. Together, they smartly wrote a lawsuit to stop custody and prove that the girl, Betty, was related to her grandma. Andrew told Wendy that the process would not be quick and could take up to two months after they filed the case in court. During this time, Andrew made it clear that the court could order a genetic study, in which samples would be taken and compared. Wendy felt better about the delay because she knew that the other family wouldn't be able to accept Betty either. Andrew said he would try to get Wendy a free pass to go see Betty at the home during this time. Wendy thanked Andrew, broke down in tears, and reached into her bag for her purse. She was so grateful. Wendy thanks Andrew from the bottom of her heart for helping her prove that Betty was her granddaughter. She offered Andrew money as a thank you gift, but he frowned and waved his hands, refusing to take any money. He told Wendy about how she had taken care of him and helped him when he needed it. Andrew said that his mother had told him about Wendy's kindness and how there were not many experts in the city like her. He told her he would be there for her if she had any more problems and wished her luck. Wendy was able to see Betty while the case was going on, and their relationship got stronger. Wendy went to see Betty every weekend and brought her sweets and fruits. They had deep talks. Betty had a hard past, but the trips made her life better and happier. Wendy was amazed at how smart Betty was and how much she loved reading. Betty would often bring her kids books from her home library. Wendy and Betty were looking forward to the day they could be together as a family and couldn't wait for the results of the genetic test. They felt like they were soulmates. Wendy was sure that the result would be good because she was sure that Betty was her granddaughter. She thought that the genetic test was just a procedure. Wendy was thrilled at first, but when she was called to the board of trustees to hear the results, she was shocked and confused. The black and white data showed that there was no family ties, Betty was not Wendy's granddaughter. I couldn't hold back tears, and the headmistress smiled meanly, enjoying Wendy's pain. Wendy went up to the headmistress and told her she had been playing with their feelings for a long time, making her feel cheated and confused. As a joke, the headmistress asked Wendy if she was happy now and if she felt like she had been treated fairly. Wendy was devastated by the news, which made her question everything she thought she knew to be true. Did I not tell you that this would happen? You didn't want to work together and be fair. You are the only one to blame now. Thank you. When Wendy called Jenna, she was crying. Jenna, I feel like my world is collapsing. The results of the examination revealed that Betty isn't related to us. It's hard to accept. I cherished her so much, and now it's over. I can't believe it's true. I'm facing the heartbreak of losing her, watching her being handed over to strangers. Betty hopes it won't be for long, and we'll be together again, but I feel like I've deceived and betrayed her. Life is so unfair. A friend rushed to help her, saying, don't let it get to you. We've overcome challenges before. Pull yourself together, take some valacordine, and confront this. Call Andrew again, maybe he can offer guidance. My instincts tell me something is amiss here. Wendy couldn't hold back her tears in the lawyer's office. She gave Andrew a picture of her late son James and a picture of herself. Weeping, she said, look, Andrew, see the resemblance. 
I don't need an expert to tell me they look alike. Betty feels like family to me, and the timing matches. She has the same mother as James, the woman he lived with before he passed away. I don't understand how the results could be negative. What am I supposed to do, stand by and watch my granddaughter be taken by strangers, suffering without love? What's the point of all this for the poor child? She continued, and, by the way, I forgot to give you the tape recorder. Listen to this. The manager told me this when we first met, and now she adds that since I didn't comply with her terms, the girl won't see her. Listen carefully. The lawyer, after hearing the tape, was astonished. Wendy, why didn't you show me this earlier? Everything has changed. Now it all makes sense. I think we should ask for a second test to be done in a different lab. That's our right. To expose the corruption, we should get the press involved, ideally TV and the internet. Get ready, because it's going to be hard, but we'll fight back. As a lawyer, I can promise you that there is a good chance of winning, Jenna said to show her support for Andrew. I have a son who works as a journalist for the local newspaper. I'll ask him for help. We have to start somewhere. Andy thought, why didn't I think of that before? Wendy smiled and wiped away her tears as she thanked everyone for being there for her. I never would have thought of anything like this myself. Maybe I could really get the supervisor to come clean. I could take Betty's material to another lab. How could I have believed them so blindly and fallen in love? A second genetic test done by a different lab showed a totally different result, putting the chance of the relationship at 99.9%. Thomas, Jenna's son, negotiated with local television, and Wendy, along with Betty, the shelter manager Molly, and lawyer Andrew, were invited to participate in the program Law and Order. It was a paid case, and Molly, thinking she held all the trump cards, readily agreed, anticipating fame and money. Unaware of another expertise and the real true result, she aimed to portray Wendy as a half-crazy old woman wearing out the nerves of good people, falsely claiming she wanted to take the girl she didn't even know. At the start of the show, some background information was given about Wendy's life and Betty's complicated ending. Andrew, the lawyer, skillfully and legally explained everything, showing all the proof and giving the other side no room to move. The live telling of the re-examination result had a huge effect, and Molly's pride and arrogance went away. It took her a while to say it, but she finally did, I'm so sorry, there's just been a misunderstanding. At the end of the show, the host was positive and wished Wendy a happy meeting with her granddaughter. Ratings went through the roof as regular people spoke out against the unfairness in the workplace, condemning the obvious abuse and extortion from a respected doctor and the planned separation of a native grandma from her orphaned granddaughter. The public was skeptical and angry when Molly tried to act like she didn't understand. Unfortunately, it was too late, the public's anger had already begun to build. Both the orphanage and the lab were audited and inspected, which revealed a long-running plan to scam people who weren't paying attention. With the help of the lab head, Molly had always used tricks to trick people. When people found out that the investigation's results were false, they were willing to pay anything to get their money back from selling children. Smart women who had helped with the lie were now facing harsh punishments for their serious crimes and had no way to get away. Wendy didn't give up and worked hard to finish all the paperwork needed to legally adopt Betty. After a month, she finally got formal custody of her granddaughter without any problems, delays, or problems with the paperwork. Wendy led the child away from the horrible home with joy in her heart. She was carrying a small bag of things. Betty was so happy that she wouldn't have to spend another day in the hospital that it was the happiest day of her life. When they walked into their apartment, Sam was excited and greeted them at the door. He was looking forward to meeting his granddaughter, so he put on a suit and shirt for the big event. Betty walked up to him with confidence and put out her warm little hand. Hello, Grandpa. I'm Betty, your granddaughter. Grandma told me so much about you. Do you really have the most authentic coin collection? Will you show me? There must be some really, really old ones, she asked. 
Sam's eyes lit up with feeling when he saw how much he looked like little James. He smiled and winked at her, then said, well, granddaughter, let's go to my office. I have a lot of interesting things there, like a ship's helm and a captain's cap. While this was going on, Wendy set the table and went to call the family to dinner. She sneaked a peek into her husband's office and saw a sweet scene, Betty singing a counting song while sitting on her grandfather's lap. It was a happy and funny room, and Wendy couldn't remember seeing her husband so happy since James passed away. Betty ate soup and cakes for lunch and praised her grandmother's cooking skills. She offered to help clean and wash the dishes because she wanted to help. The woman was so happy because no one had cared about her so much in a long time. The grandmother and grandfather's lives had changed for the better when their granddaughter arrived. This effect was especially clear in Sam, who spent a lot of time drawing, writing, and talking with his niece. His memory and reaction time got faster, his motor skills and moves got better, and he got excited about life all over again. It was bound to happen, having a niece to care for and cheer him up had given him new life. Within no time, their warm family grew to include a new member. Wendy noticed a strange and tense silence in the flat one evening after coming home from counseling. Betty was deeply focused on her homework, and Sam pretended to be interested in a TV show. The new school tights were washed and mended by hand by a child in the bathroom and hung on the heater. Wendy looked more closely and saw a big tear on her granddaughter's knee that was completely covered in something green. Wendy was scared and asked, my dears, what happened? Betty, I just bought you those tights the day before yesterday. How did you get them to tear so badly? What happened? Did you fall? Don't be unclear, please. Put everything in order for me. The girl looked scared and then said, bah, this is what happened. Please don't swear. When I got home from school, I saw Alex and Ben, two mean boys, beating a little cat in the yard. It was crying because they made fun of it by tying a tin can to its tail. I took the kitten away from them because I couldn't stand it. It ran away and climbed up a tree, so I went after it. I just about got him down, but my tights got caught on something, and I scratched my leg. What did you do to fight back? Did you talk to the boys from the tree? Betty, you might have broken something when you fell. Well, you're a girl after all. I couldn't leave a defenseless animal in the lurch, the granddaughter said with a blink. They would have hurt it so badly that it passed away. I didn't hit them, I just hit them a few times with a suitcase to scare them. The kitten's name is Snowy. He's really cute and funny. Grandpa, he's great. At first, Sam was worried that people might not want animals in the apartment, so he asked, my dear girl, don't you want to tell me that the animal is already in our house? Before she could answer, Snowy, a white kitten, rolled out of her room. It looked around and saw Wendy. It rubbed its ear on her leg to show it liked her, and then it jumped into Sam's arms. He gave Snowy a friendly smile and stroked her hair and pink belly. The kitten purred and closed its eyes right away in happiness. As she walked in, a happy girl holding a string with a candy wrapper on it said, Snowy the cat's coming out, Grandma. Look how he can do it. You're going to leave the world laughing, Grandpa. They laughed out loud as the kitten bounced around on its hind legs, trying to catch the wrapper. Wendy couldn't hold back her laughs and lost it. She gave her granddaughter a warm hug and kiss on the top of the head and asked, What are we going to do with you? Okay, let him stay, but you have to take care of him, clean the litter box and feed him yourself. Okay, you little fox, growing up just like your father. Grandpa's right, I've always been against animals in the apartment, and now I've let him down in his old age. Betty jumped for joy, kissed her grandmother, and happily said, Here, Grandpa. Betty sneaked into the room in her jammies and hid under the covers. Sam had been asleep for a while. Surprised, he awoke and inquired, My sweetie, why are you still up? You have to get up early for school tomorrow, don't you? Or are you in pain? Betty replied calmly, You told me today, Grandma, that I'm just like my father, just a sleigh. And now I keep thinking about it. 
I can't sleep. Tell me about daddy. What was he like? I don't know him at all. Why didn't he live with us? The woman got up, went to the loft, got the album, and sat down next to her granddaughter. It was quiet. She began to talk about the memories as she turned the pages. Look, this is James when he was one year old. He was funny and fat like a doll. And this is your dad when he was six years old. We bought him a new bag and took a picture of him. Look at how important he is. You're just as smart as your dad, who wrote a lot of books. At school, they told him nice things. I'll even show you his report card tomorrow. Also, here is your dad as an adult with some college friends. Look at how much you look like him, your hair, eyebrows, and face shape. Betty was eager to know what happened next. Why is there no picture of my mother? Didn't he love her at all? And why didn't he ever come to us? The woman sighed heavily, trying to figure out how to tell her son the hard truth about his life, which was tainted by his promiscuous and forgetful mother. Wendy was very careful with the hard job and picked each word with great care. Your dad met your mom and fell in love with her. They moved in together, away from your grandfather and me. That's why there aren't any more shots, buddy. He chose to make a lot of money, so he went very far away. Too bad something bad happened, and your dad lost life on the job. Your mom was sad about his passing and then found out she was going to have a baby. That's how you were made. We didn't know anything about you, though, because your mother didn't tell us. I have no idea why, but I'm sure she loved you too. Who wouldn't love a smart girl like you? We can go see your dad's and mom's graves this weekend if you want. We'll make it nice again and bring them flowers. The girl sat closer to Wendy and whispered, Thank you for telling me, Grandma. It all makes sense to me now. I knew my parents were very good. These words made Wendy's heart race, and she gently stroked the girl's wild curls and said, That's it, little bunny. Now it's time to go to sleep. Come on, I'll tuck you in. Wendy couldn't help but admire the little girl as she quickly fell asleep. She tried not to cry as she thought about her son James. Oh, my son James, why did you leave this life so soon? You never got to see your little girl, and she's such a clever girl, just like you. I'm sorry, son. If I'd known it would turn out like this, I wouldn't have forbidden Emily to meet you. Maybe then he wouldn't have taken that job, and life would have been different. You know, I'm not leaving Betty. We'll raise her well with Sam. She's my light in the window now, my happiness. The woman wiped away a tear, turned off the nursery's night light, and went to sleep. She told herself that not telling anyone about the girl's mother's bad qualities was the right thing to do. She didn't need to know any more about her mother than what she already knew. Wendy thought it was important for Betty to know that her parents loved her very much and were good people. Wendy and her niece went to see her father's grave over the weekend. A strong memorial with his picture on it stood there, with two snow-white birch trees growing next to it. When they got to Emily's grave, it was a sad sight. It was overgrown, and the name and times of birth and passing were written on a plaque that was hard to see. Grandma, I dream about my mother a lot. I still miss her. Why don't we clean up in here? I want my mom's place to be just as neat and clean. They jumped on board with the cause with all their hearts and planned everything with great care. After a week, Wendy planned a simple funeral. But she ran into trouble when she saw that there was no picture of the woman. Wendy turned to her granddaughter Betty and asked her if she had a picture of her mom that she could put on the tombstone. Betty paused and said she didn't want to talk to her stepfather because she was afraid of him because of how he behaved. Wendy told Betty that she would take care of things herself and asked for the address of their old home. Wendy went to Betty's stepfather's house the next day with her strong-willed friend Jenna to ask for a picture of the woman. During the trip, Jenna stated her confusion, asking Wendy why she had suddenly gone from being angry at Emily to trying to honor her. Wendy said that she was only doing what she was doing for Betty because the girl wanted her mother's memory to be as important as her father's. When they got to the address, 
they were shocked to see that the broken down house had been left empty and ignored. Even the windows were closed up, and the rusty lock showed that the house had been empty for a long time. Jenna recommended getting information from the neighbors. On the porch, an old woman named Camille who looked about their age showed up. Wendy, who was a little confused, told them what they were doing and asked about their friend Anthony. Camille told them that Anthony was no longer alive because he had tragically passed away three months before in an accident while drunk. The town had to bury him because he had no family and none of his friends were around. After many calls to the police and district officials, Camille finally came to the conclusion that their pain was over. He really did cause trouble, he was a miserable person. It's polite to not say bad things about the passing, but there wasn't much good to say about him. A friend gave Wendy the key to Betty's stepfather's house and warned her about how crazy it was inside. Wendy and her friend turned on the lights and went inside. When they saw how bad the house was, they were shocked. It looked like a pigsty, with a dirty bed, empty bottles, and dried out food all over the place. When Wendy thought about how bad things had been for Betty, she couldn't help but feel sick. In her mind, Betty had told her to get her backpack and bunny out of the mess. Wendy wasn't sure where the record was, but she thought it might be in the closet on the top shelf, since that's what her granddaughter remembered. Jenna, who was feeling uneasy, told Wendy to focus on finding the picture and going right away to avoid possible health risks. The old man opened the closet door, looked on the top shelf, and sure enough, he found an album. She didn't have much time to look at it, so she chose to take the whole record home. She found Wendy squished Betty's backpack, the one with the bunny, at the bottom of the closet. They got up right away and left, giving the key back to a neighbor. When Wendy got home, her niece and Sam were waiting for her with a lot of worry. Betty, who was happy and relieved, gave her grandma a big hug and told her she was worried about her long absence. Wendy told her everything was okay and gave her the record and the backpack with the rabbit in it. Betty was so happy that she told everyone that the backpack was a gift from her mom that she bought for her in kindergarten. She asked to keep it in her room and said she would wash it because it was dirty and dusty. When asked, Wendy agreed and said, I don't mind. Wendy decided to look in all of the small bags before washing so that she wouldn't hurt the washer. As she went through them, she found a few, and she felt something heavy in one of the front pockets. She reached inside and found a package, which interested her. She was shocked to find a gold chain with a pendant when she mechanically unfolded it. It had a large amount of rolled up cash and the words, I love you more than life, yours James, engraved on it. She also saw a note that was folded several times and had beautiful handwriting on it. The note had a touching message from Emily's mother. It said that the pendant was a birthday present from Emily's father that was made at his request. In her last moments, the mother told her son she loved him and felt bad about what she had done. Wendy gave Betty the necklace, the money, and the touching note with tears in her eyes, telling her that she found them in her backpack pocket. As she read the note, she told Betty that it was from her mother and that the words were supposed to be treasured as a reminder. It made Betty feel better to read the letter over and over again, especially the line, I love you, my darling. She felt a link with her late mother and asked Wendy to help her put on the pendant, which was a way of keeping her parents close to her heart. Betty suggested that the money her mother left behind be used to build a shrine in her mother's honor, stressing how important it was to her. Sam, Wendy, and Betty were sitting at the table together looking through a book that was full of pictures of James that Emily had taken of him having a good time. They all chose a beautiful close-up picture of Emily, and Sam quietly said, Yes, Betty, your daddy loved your mother very much. I can tell you that. The girl was amazed and said, That's my dad. I've seen these pictures of my mom's youth a hundred times, and I didn't know it was him. The money was enough to pay for Emily's headstone and make Betty's long-held dream come true. She had wanted to see the sea in real life since she was a child, not just in pictures or on TV. Along with family friend Jenna, the four of them agreed to go on vacation together. 
Wendy was glad to have a break from her normal schedule and joked that she rarely got to warm up her arthritis and smooth out her wrinkles in salt water. The trip will never be forgotten. Betty loved the sea and enjoyed diving, gathering shells and pebbles, and being amazed by how beautiful it was. Sam looked out at the endless blue water, breathed in the salty sea air, and almost burst into tears of happiness. He thanked Wendy for the unexpected change of events by kissing her hands. Even though he was depressed at first because he was stuck in a chair, couldn't move his hands or feet, and had trouble speaking, Sam found new meaning and happiness in his life. He said that Betty had revived him and brought him back to life by herself. At first, Sam didn't think he'd ever see the sea again. But now he was truly happy and thanked Wendy for being his totem, muse, and amulet. Wendy showed her love for Sam in a way that was similar to how they loved each other when they were young, but even deeper. At a happy moment, Wendy kissed Sam, he hugged a tanned and happy Betty, and they all waved to Jenna who was flying far away. Each of them was filled with a deep sense of happiness and satisfaction as they entered a new and strange part of their lives. 